On this episode of Between Two Beers, we talk to Kevin Fallon. Fallon is New Zealand's most famous football coach and arguably our best. He co-coached, as he calls it, the All Whites during the epic 16-game run to the 1982 World Cup and then took over the head coaching duties from 85 to 88. Kev has won almost every award and championship worth winning in this country, from the Chatham Cup to the National League, and he's picked up 31 national and local titles across his 14 years at Mount Albert Grammar High School. And he's still going strong today. At 72, he's still on the grass four times a week, coaching Manukau United in the Northern Premier League and hoping to take them to the National League this year. In this episode, we talk about the struggles of coaching a National League team as a 24-year-old in Gisborne, the time he fought Ken Dugdale at training, what it was like watching his son Rory score that winner against Bahrain on that special night in Wellington, his reflections on his controversial sacking from Mount Albert Grammar School, and how he turned Gisborne into a footballing juggernaut. Fallon's back catalogue of stories and experiences was fairly daunting in scale. He's seen it all and done it all. It's just incredible someone who was coaching in the early 70s is still coaching today in New Zealand's most competitive club competition. And he hasn't lost any of his enthusiasm or his energy. Kev was cracking company and a true legend of the Kiwi game. For show notes, links to listen and watch, visit betweentwobears.com. If you like what we're doing and want to support the show for a cup of coffee a month, click the link to our Patreon page. Many thanks to those already on board. Enjoy the app. Kevin Fallon, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thank you. Seamus and I have made the trip to our Fitu. A Fitu, which is <laughs> north of uh, Waiuku. Uh, Kev has been here for three months and it's a beautiful spot. He's just taken us for a tour of his garden and we've had a look at the, the beach and the water. And yeah, it's a, it's a pretty perfect spot you've got here, Kev. Um, how's the travel into Centre Park four times a week? I wouldn't say I've got over it yet, but I'm getting used to it. It's, um, it's about an hour and a quarter. But it's, uh, I'd rather not have it, of course. You know, I'd rather be next door to the ground. Like years ago, I was in Hamilton, they got me a house and it was across the road from Muir Park. But um, I've got to travel and that's part and parcel of the job this year and we'll see what it's like at the end of the year. Yeah, pretty good trade-off because it is it's pretty beautiful here, Shane. It's not bad out here, is it? It's, I've only ever flown over on a plane heading into Auckland Airport, so it's nice to, to view it from uh, ground level. Yeah. Shane, why don't you get us started? How do you know Kevin Fallon? I don't think Kevin's going to remember this, but in about 2000, I was part of a Solomon Islands under 20 training squad. Now, I get hammered on this podcast a lot because people don't think I ever played, but at one point, I was okay. And <laughs> some of my contemporaries were George Surrey, who later came and joined you at Mags. Kevin actually asked me, um, would I be interested in, in coming to Mags to play in goal? Unfortunately, I'd, I'd left Hamilton Boys at that stage, so I was just in my first year of university, but I was flattered because I'd only ever known who he was by name. I'd seen him coach um, the under-17s, which was my year, um, but it just didn't happen, and then I retired about three years later. <laughs> Kev, Kev, any memory of, of said conversation? No, it's quite right. I never remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, one, no, one can be, no one can verify that. <laughs> no, to, to, be, to be serious, he was probably right. Yeah. Um, and Steve, you nearly played under Kevin. I nearly played, yeah. Kev was going to take Waikato FC ooh, about 10 years ago, and I think I'd signed for him or I'd verbally agreed to come in, but for one reason or another, he didn't make the starting line as the coach. And I think we've only had a, a couple of conversations. Uh, I've played against his team for Monaco for the last three or four years, so we've had a sort of a couple of chats. There was one particular game where they beat us 1-0 and they sort of claimed promotion. I remember talking to Kev afterwards. Mm. Um, but don't know him that well, but excited to really dig into a lot of stuff here. The other thing I should mention is I actually lived next door to Kev for about six months and still never, didn't say hello. No, nah, never built up the courage to go and knock on his door and go in for a beer. There is a little bit of that about the aura of Kevin. Yeah, Fallon. a little bit, a little bit of an intimidating presence. I was a sort of young 20s working at OFC and Kev was sort of the, the mags guy at the time. And yeah, I, I, I didn't have it in me to go and knock on the door. I wish I had, but, but, but here we are. Here we are making up for some lost time. So anyway, that aside, Kev, there's a ton of stuff we're going to get through, but the place I want to start 
is actually your journaling. Now, a well-placed source has told us that you've kept a diary, a daily diary since the 70s. One day per page, every training session, result, how the day's been going right back. So what exactly do you write in it and what do you get from it? It's an A4 diary. Well, there's a couple over there on the, on the desk. There's one from uh, probably 1980. I went back and started looking at the work I was doing in 80 and just seeing how I've progressed or how much I do the same stuff and so on. And it's a list of players. It's basically the time they had on the field. If they were subbed, I give them a mark from one to 10. Uh, I do a little report at the end of the game, maybe a little bit about the opposition as well. Certainly these days about the referee. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's a notation for me to keep me I'll just flick over if I blame Melvin. Oh yeah, yeah. And I've looked at tactically what I got from that game, just a few notes and and so on. And uh, it's been very helpful, you know, over the years. And that adds up to me player of the year. I look look at the points and total it up. So it's not just a wild guess. Sometimes you think to yourself, oh, he's done well this year. But once you start adding things up, there might be more consistency from somebody who's just not getting the great games, but is consistent every week and so on. So I find it. And my thoughts and feelings, because I've always felt one day I'd write a book about, you know, 50 years in football, or even 50 years coaching. It, it must be noteworthy, particularly when the top of it is the World Cup and you run out against Brazil and somebody said, who's going to pick up Zico? <laughs> and you take two more tablets and you have a look around the dressing room. And, you know, I mean, that's the height, I suppose. But then there was a lot of exciting times, you know, in between at club level in New Zealand and, and particularly in schools football, where... I think I was the instigator of early morning training and then people going on to academies and stuff like that. I think if you look at it, a lot of it did originate with the work that I did. It's an incredibly long period of time to be maintaining a practice. I've recently, I'm in a bit of a self-help journey myself and I've recently started journaling about two weeks ago and I find it quite hard to actually get in the habit of maintaining it. So when do you do it? At night time with a beer, get a Peroni beer and fill it in after training but they say if you keep keep a diary today it'll keep you tomorrow and it has been very very helpful you know as I said because I do intend to turn it into you know into a probably into a book mm. you, you whether I will or not is, is, that's yeah. the thing. you mentioned before it's your, some of your personal thoughts and feelings so it's not just a football diary it's also kind of a, a track of things that are happening in your life it could be crazy things you know I mean particularly when you move out here it could to do with the weather the winds the animals you know, the rabbits digging up my lawn. <laughs> you know, I, there's so many things I put in there, which I think, and there's other things. I mean, I put things down because as you get older, you forget things. I could be walking around here thinking, I'll put that in there, and then get to the bedroom, and you've lost it because your mind's on something else. You know, so I, I found it invaluable for sort of recording your thoughts. And it's, it's, it can look, I suppose, reading some of it over, all over the shop a little bit, but it means a lot to me. It might have been a thought, a feeling, because I do a weekly blog. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we read those on and Facebook. We're talking and I've got out. like a thought of the week or a word of the week, and it all comes from that. Mm. You know, I find when I go from Sunday to Sunday, I underline it in red these days, so I'll take out the red and there's my blog. Mm. So it, it saves me a lot of work. I mean... If you're writing a, you know, a blog the size of the one I do, which is not a specific size, it's just my thoughts and my ramblings of my mind. You couldn't do that, I don't think, if you didn't have a few notes like, like I've got to, you know, just go and say, training, Steve all the way. And so, you know, and you've got, every, might just be in your name, but you might have a recording that brings back, you know, what I want to say. Sounds like we might be in the, uh, the blog next week. <laughs> I think so. Have a look. Here's hoping. <laughs> no, I think you will. There we go. Check it out on Manukau FC's website, uh, Facebook page. It's on, yeah, yeah, it's on that. And then I try and they stick it on my page. And There's I've a got about 10,000 pages though because I stuff up. And <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did I wonder forget, that. I keep forgetting my password. <laughs> I did wonder that. I, 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 in preparation for this, I read through and well, I saw... Are you good on the internet? Um, okay. Well, you can rub some up. <laughs> yeah. Pretty handy around a few sites. But I did notice there was, two, there was 2021 and then I scrolled down thinking, oh, I'll catch the one from January. And it went all the way back to 2018. So I thought, oh, there's a bit of a... Yeah. No, it's a stuff up because Kevin's <laughs> forgot his password. <laughs>
so in preparation for this chat, um, I went back and read a lot through the book um, in New Zealand's World Cup, The Inside Story, written by Armin Lindenberg, which was published in 1982. Yeah. And there were some pretty fascinating passages, which I sort of want to touch on. And one of them is actually to do with your wife, uh, Mihi, who we just, mm -hmm. just met. I've been married over 40 years, um, met in Gisborne. And one of the quotes says, um, I'm fortunate that I have a wife who's so interested in my work. She's got all the projected league tables of every game, what she expects, and she works them out all week by week. She's been a great learning post for me in my career. So this was in 1982, perhaps from the 1981 season. So she would would have like a, a league table on the sort of dining room table at home and you'd come home and she'd work out like where teams would be. And discover, you know, pieces of paper. And she's got the National League set out and the projected results. And then we'll have, you know, the arm where they finish and everything else. Yeah, she was, it, it's been important that she's, you can go to football and if you're not home at nine o'clock, it's 9.30. There's no problems and no moaning, no groaning, and knowledge have to be fitted in with the football. And I think that's really important. You know, if you meet somebody, you could fall in love with a woman. If you don't like football and you've been through what I've been through, you've got no chance. I mean, you'll end up single without a shadow of a doubt. They've, you, they've got to buy into what you do, you know, as simple as that. Which is really interesting because we've just met Mary yeah. and she sort of said she had zero interest in football. Yeah, before she, she met you, yeah, so she, yeah. this is all learned but behaviour? She was a netball rep for Gisborne. Right. She's, her, her and her family played A-grade netball, you know, with the Sandra Edges and all them kind. She was in that team, yeah. you know, so she was actually, she, um, she, she's training, you know, for netball. Mm -hmm. Childers Road is next door to the netball courts, so I'd often be peering through the wire, <laughs> checking out the legs. Yeah. But no, they... they they trained right next to us, so you knew them all. And they weren't a bad side. They said at that time, Mary was in the side, Sandra Edge was in it. And she went on, I think, to the... Yeah, she would call them, the Silver Spurs. Yeah. She played a bit, she played a bit. Yeah. 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 That Thomas was in the side. He yeah. was in, actually in the football team with me. The brother, younger brother, when he was 16. That's right. Threw him in. Yeah, well, what an incredible uh, support, that base that yeah. has helped you have the career you've had, right? You're yeah. coming home to that, you know, she's invested with you. you yeah, yeah, it's easy. You come home and your shepherd spies on the table. You know, it's just it's just amazing. The kids had that as well. She, she, don't forget, Mary was the one who ran Sean and Rory around, you know, to the matches because I'd be somewhere else and so on. And, you know, so it's a massive commitment for my wife. You know, if you've got two lads who are playing rep football and, you know, they're footballers and she's the one who's doing the taxi job, isn't she? You yeah. know, so that, and that's the hard bit. Mm. Not the training. And a marriage that's stood the test of time. Yeah, it's it's still survived. still yeah. together now and still yeah, uh, survive. seemingly from that quick interaction, still very much yeah. in love. So congrats. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, okay, the next p passage I want to touch on is, is what it was sort of Kevin Fallon on Kevin Fallon. And, and you said, um, I think all of us have certain gifts. And mine is that I think I instill a little bit of fear into players. Hopefully it's not the physical kind now, though obviously I'm not big enough to inflict that on players. But I don't believe in it now. But I do believe that somehow you have to make players play. How you do that is part of the art of being a coach. And in preparation, I spoke to Hane Fowler, who's played with you, you know, as, as long as perhaps anyone uh, at Mags and then recently at Monaco. Um, and he said your style sort of changed a bit across the years. He said at half time in a Mags changing room, if things were going poorly, it would be sort of like the hairdryer treatment. It would be loud, it would be in your face, there'd be that element to it. But in recent years at Monaco, there was none of that. He said you'd found a different way. Um, so how did your coaching communication and perhaps your temperament evolve? I think it went, I went through that phase, I mean, without a doubt. And, uh, and it's not just going through something that is concocted, it's, it's actually how you feel. You know, I'll give you a classic one. I mean, this is a classic. I remember when I was a player at Southend United, we had a manager called Arthur Rowley and we were losing, I think, 2-1 at half-time to it, or maybe 1-0. But he came in at half-time and he had a big, like, a, you know, these sort of teddy bear coloured crombie overcoats. He opened the door, we were losing, not playing well, so everybody sat down with their heads down. The door creaked and in came Arthur, he's a big lad. He was a, and he, if you look at his name, he's, he scored the most goals in the football league for years up front and inside left, big bloke played for Shrewsbury. <clears throat> he looked around, got the heads down, but I was sort of peering. And he's not happy, obviously, because he just slammed the door. And he said, 
Fucking hell. Fuck me. For fuck's sake. And they slammed the door and went out. <laughs> Everybody cracked up laughing. We went out and won. So his two, his, his team talk was how many fucking hell, fuck me, for fuck's sake. Six or seven words and that was his team talk and he went. But I mean, that's the type of thing I'm talking about, what you've come through. I mean, that, that I found that so funny and I never use things like that. And you're going at half time sometimes, you know exactly what you're going to say. And sometimes you're like an actor on a stage, it just comes, you know, sometimes what comes out of your mouth, it just comes out and it evolves, but it works. So, so it's probably a little bit of a gift. Half time's a funny time. You can lose a team. And I never say anything at full time. Win, lose or draw, I usually leave it. If they've lost, it wouldn't be good. If they've won, they're, they're happy enough anyway. Yeah. So I don't, I don't bother at full time, you know, but half time is, is a funny time, as I said, and sometimes I go in there and it just comes. Yeah. I'm walking in there and it just comes and it develops and away we go and it can be funny. Mm. But that's come in the latter days, as Oni said, it's, um, it's, you don't think so much. I'm more likely to give a player, come on, you know, these days, mm. you know, people, some of the players who play for me sometimes get a hug. You know, I mean, come on. Let's get going with better than this. You know, it's it's your style's your style and I don't think you can you can't be somebody else. You just be yourself. Yeah. You know, I mean over the years when I've read about football, if you said who's influenced me, I mean definitely Ferguson. I've met Ferguson as well, by the way, at Manchester United. And then definitely another one who I met, Brian Clough. Now, I went to training when he was at Forest. His his assist one of his assistants, Alan Hill, used to play with me at Rotherham United, where I played with him. He was a senior goalkeeper and I was in the reserves. And um, he said to Brian Clough, oh, Kev was with me at Rotherham Boss. And as soon as he said that, he'd been a pro you're in. Right. And Clough ended up at the end of the night getting up and putting his arms around me. He said, you're a football man. Yeah. And you can have anybody you want from this club. This is on loan, you know, that type of thing. And he sent, he sent me, and who did he say? He sent two players over to New Zealand. I didn't get one off him, but he did send to Glenn, Centre forward, two players from Forest came to New Zealand did quite well. I forgot the names of them though. Hmm. It is interesting because, as I kind of alluded to earlier, growing up, there was this aura about you, yeah. and and there was an intimidation factor. And this is a little bit similar to when we had Declan Edge on, where I hadn't had very many conversations with with Declan before. And there's a perception that you build in your mind when you don't know someone, you only know someone through third party. Yeah. And then you sit down and you have a chat and you go. Well, it's completely different to kind of what I thought, but the, yeah, that sort of late nineties, two thousands, Kevin Fallon was in my mind, like a real fire breathing kind of dragon. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, your players find you different that uh, uh, people like Connie and people like that have been with you a long time will find you. Well, we don't find him like that at all. Although it can erupt as you know, mm -hmm. it, can, it can be like that, but. I don't know, it's, um, I'll give you an example. You walk into a dressing room, and this is prior to the game, and the music's going, we've got the boom box on, and I'm ready to talk, so I might just go, and it goes off instantly. Now that's, that's the respect you want as a coach. Mm -hmm. You just look, I mm -hmm. just look at you, say, and they know, oh, turn it off, he wants to talk. Yeah. Now the minute I lose that, I won't coach. Because that's respect and that's control and that they know that you know yeah. that there's only one boss here, and that's me. What? How much emphasis do you put in that pre-match talk? I know like the All Blacks have sort of gone and said that that there's no pre-match talk anymore because you need to know if you don't know what you need to know a few hour, an hour before the game, then you're not prepared. Then you haven't done the job during the week. Do you do you give big speeches or motivational talks? Yeah, I get them up before the game. And, and is that a very important I don't part? take the warm-up, you've got to remember that. I never take warm-up. I mean, players, who's going to take the warm-up? I said, warm yourself up like I used to. I mean, just think about this. We used to run out, quarter to three, for three o'clock kickoff. We changed into the strip. Jog, stretch. I'm a centre-back, so I've got a few headers in. Then I start knocking a few short balls, and I've clipped a few into the centre-forward. Then I stop, stretch, do a few sprints. Ref comes out, two captains go up, shake hands, we're playing. Yeah. Now the silly buggers go back, 
take the gear off, mm. sit down listening to the coach, and then they go out and they, they need to warm up again. Yeah. I can't see the sense of it, whether it's FIFA 11 or what. Yeah. And I don't like cones on my pitch. You know, I don't like, I use the markings and everything else. And I use distance, spa so you're looking at spaces. If you say 20 yards, hey, 20 yards, I push you back. And if you know when it's 10, and you, and you should know that, spatial understanding on a football pitch. Yeah. So there's all them kind of old-fashioned ways that I've still got, because I believe in them. Mm. Not because somebody's got driving a unit and got NZFA and the fern on, and they sat there doing nothing all day. You know, when I used to work there, I'd be out, centres of excellence, senior football, training squad, non-stop. I'd get home at midnight. You know, I mean, I was dedicated to the job, still am. But I've got my own ways and my own beliefs, because over the years, I know they work. You know, I've not come out of a, a sports course and thinking, I think we'll try this. And I think as players, they know that. When you've got experienced players, they know, they know if you're bullshitted, that's for sure. But you are willing to evolve and you, you feel like it's fair, from what I've read, you find that a very important part of improving as a coach, always being open to new ideas. I read a book a week and sometimes it's on self-development. So you can look at my bookcase and there's heaps of books to yet to be unpacked. But it could be on in, in pursuit of excellence. It could be anything on football. Most football books, I'm, you know, I've got that many football books. It's not, when I die, I don't want to happen to them. Mm. I've got that many of them. You know, I could open a bookshop. Books and music seem to be quite big in your life, yeah, and, and they also tie in. You know, I mean, this, I'm reading now about Elvis Costello, his, his memoir. So I put his music up. Yeah, and I've, I've, I'm a Costello fan, sort of, but not madly. He's a bit alternative and offbeat but you start playing I mean well, it's not bad it's quite good Alison you're listening to Alison and you, you know I mean it's where you go yeah. so it, it breaks you out of the normal path that you're on you can be on and get boring I suppose if you're on the same route for 50 years mm. so try a bit of that try a bit of that and that's the same with football somebody might come and say da 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 and I'll look at it I might be looking at your work and, I, and this is this was a favourite when I went to watch Ajax, Liverpool, Manchester United in the off season. Yeah, I used to go for a week and I'd take my notebook. I could show you there the Ajax work when, when Davids and all them were there. I'd write it down. Then I'd get it printed out and everything else. And I thought, I'll use that because that I think that is great. Mm. You know, so you're not in it, you're not a shut shop. Mm. You know, the doors open for good ideas. And if a player come up to me and said, Kev, do you think we could do, 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 do? And I'd look at it, and maybe I'd take it on board. You can't afford to say, I know everything. Mm. You know, you, you have become a coach, you're very experienced, but you don't know everything. You learn something, even if it's a new word, every day. One of the, the mind games aspects that I picked up, again, from, from this book, is how you said you loved getting inside players' heads, um, said you've got to affect them mentally. And in research for this, we, we spoke to two former Mags players, you know, Davinder Singh and Ross McKenzie. And so I said, well, what was your experience with Kev? How did he affect you in your game? And they both had quite funny anecdotes, I thought, which perhaps paint this pretty well. D, who was a, a striker at the time, I think, yeah, got converted. Yeah, defender. Yeah, ended up as a defender. <laughs> but he said he came there and he was a sort of, you know, young guy, didn't really know much about anything as it's anywhere in his. Um, and he said he was playing striker, and he said that you <laughs> subbed yourself on to go and mark him during a game. It was like a training game, and just kicked the shit out of him, just for 20 minutes, just absolutely battered him. And he said that is something that always stuck with him, is that this is how tough I have to be. This is what my coach expects from me. I need to harden up. And Ross spoke about another. He said it was a game he got subbed on, maybe in the first half. And he went, so he was playing up front and he was sort of chasing a ball down. The defender went to clear one and he turned his back as the guy was kicking the ball. And he said, immediately, you subbed him off. It didn't go back on. And he said, that was like, that stuck with me for the rest of my career. You don't turn your back. You harden, you go through it, you harden up. You know, are those the sort of mind games that you played throughout your, your coaching journey? Probably still do as well. But it's, um, you know, I could be shouting on pitches to them. Sometimes a player makes out he doesn't, he can't hear you. But it, won't, it won't stop him coming off if I'm going to take him off. And he can kick a chair over, do whatever he wants, you know, but he'll come off. You know, if he's not listening and not learning and things like that, if he's a shut shop. And you get one or two like that. Uh, but them little things there, obviously they weren't meant to be, they, they happened. 
I thought that's inappropriate. That he's got to get over this, you know. And that, that that's the kind of reaction it would happen today. I've, I could look at a player in the dressing rooms, and if he's not up for it, I, even before we entered, I'd probably sub him. I said, "You off? Your mind's not on it, son. You know, you, you've, they've got to want it. I mean, players have got to want, it. and that's the thing about football. I mean, you can coach all you want, but how do you coach a winning side? I, I, I remember going round to Manica and how many of you lot have won anything? And it's not hand went up. I said, well, I've won the lot. I've won the lot. I've put teams out against Brazil. I've told people to go and pick up Socrates. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't look past that. How do we do that? You know, and, and how, how do we get to that level? And, you know, when was the last thing you won something? Uh, I won the, oh, shit. Northern Premier League? Northern Premier League. How long ago? Obviously a few years yeah, because you were thinking about it. 2012. <laughs> you know, but winning's been part and parcel. I've won things. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but winning's, I just find winning beautiful. You know, winning's lovely. Hmm. It's, the, it's the losing bit you've got to put up with, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's easy to get off a bench if you want to go and shake hands with everybody. I tend not to bother with any of it because... Hmm. That's the losing bit, comes. <laughs> so can you pick winners then? Can you see someone, you see someone playing and you see by their actions or the way they work or the way they think that they're going to be a winner? Well, it's, it's very hard these days because when you, when you go to clubs, you know, where there's not great budgets and you've got to fit in and you've got to do that and you're coaching, it's not as if, even when I was at Gisborne City, I think things will work out. Keep working hard and do things. And it might be only this. I remember in 80, when we won the league in 84, I had about 15 players. But the ones that we signed, McLaughlin, Meacock, you know, we had Grant Turner there. I think Colin Walker was there. They were quality. You know, you, you've got to have good players to win competitions. You, uh, and it dropped in place. Sometimes things can drop in place. You can be in a terrible, dire situation. Like I am at the moment in pre-season thinking, Fucking okay, hell. Giving it an Arthur Rowley. Yeah. But it can come right. Mm. You know, it only might mean two or three players. You know, you get that one and that one. Right, we can score goals. Now who's going to stop them? And right, who's going to, who's going to create them? Mm. Who's going to get the team going? You know, you, you're only looking for 11 spots, aren't you? Mm. You, know, you never know. A kid, can, a kid could come on at, you know, seven. This is the other thing, by the way. This under 20 things. Over the years, I've played heaps of under 20s. Heaps. But they were good enough. Okay, yeah. So this is one of the things we wanted to get into. So, so New Zealand football have obviously introduced um, this new sort of league format concept. And one of the rules they've introduced is that every team must start with two players under the age of 20, which has ca caused quite a division, I'd say, across the football community. I, I certainly don't agree with it. Uh, I know, Kev, you're on the same page. It, it seems like there'll be too many occasions, for me, when you're going to be playing a weakened team. You want that league to be as strong as possible and you're forced to play weaker teams so it'll be a weaker product. I thought I was the only one who cared because I've been on about it and on about it you know, for weeks because it's driving me crazy. Because I don't think New Zealand football should interfere with club football. They set the rules. That's not a rule. That's a demand. You know, you, you can't say, go. You, you definitely got to start 220s. How ridiculous. Imagine saying that at Arsenal or Manchester United. I mean, club football's there to, ultimately, to get it, I suppose, in the World Club competition. That's the ultimate thing. You do that. They're not the rules for that. Why do we think we can create rules in New Zealand better than England or Spain or France, South America? We can't. We've got to look at them and look at their experience and learn off them. That's players, coaches administration, the referees, the law. So now I don't agree with it. I think it's ridiculous. It's a problem for us. What if you haven't got two good under 20s? Or what if you do and they get injured? Or they're away yeah. trialling or go yeah. to America or what have you? You've they're, got to have more than two. Mm. Well, you've got to have more than two. Yeah. But there, there could also, I can see a situation with some big games coming up later in the season. Like you say, you've got these players injured or they are well off the pace of the rest of the squad. And they and know coach, themselves. And coaches have to put them on for yeah. a minute and sub them off and then put someone... Someone else who, who can do a much better job, and you know, it's it looks to me like a problematic ruling. And the kids themselves, I think they know that they're not good enough. To, imagine if you left played two kids and left out somebody like Sani Issa or Andre Este for two hundred twenties. Come on, mm. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's just not on. And I don't, I don't think we sh they should have even gone there, you know. And I don't know what it's for, why, why it's for. Somebody said it's to build up the under twenty side or something, and then somebody said, yeah, but the tournament's off. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's just not stacking up for me. But the flip side is, if you're good enough, you're old enough, right? And that's, that's what you've kind of prescribed to for your career. I've played players, and I can tell you this now: Creswell, Simonson, Mackay. Keith Mackay walked into a shop where I worked in Gisborne. He said, Are you Kevin Fallon? I said, yeah. I was looking at this little dormouse, a little squint. He said, uh, I've, I've come to play for Gisborne City. I said, how old are you? He said, 16. I said, oh, there's a reserve, there's a reserve group as well. So they train on this. I've not come for the reserves. He said, I've come for the first team. And that was Keith Mackay. <laughs> and he came to train. He never missed training. And then got in the first team. He was about 16, 17 when he first started for me. John Gillis was 15. I've been sat on benches in recent times at Manukau and somebody's rushed across to me and said, Kevin, can I have a word? I said, yes. Look, you've got to take that player off the field. I said, why? He's too young. You can't play. There's actually a too young oh, yeah, law yeah. as well. Yeah. Is there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Base, a base what, level. What's the age? I think 15. 15. You have to get dispensation from the parents yeah. to play. And I didn't I get it. Sean, to take him off. Sean, your son was playing National League at 15. He scored two goals in the National League against New Plymouth for Mount Monganu at 15 years of age. Yeah. You know. I, there's a couple of things there, of course. One, he was big enough. and he was strong, He's a strong lad and so was Rory. Rory's about six foot four now. But they were big lads. Mm. But they'd been trained and the mentality had been trained every day, every day, every day. So that was an important thing. And often I played them wide. Didn't stick them down the middle, put them on the flank, get you back on the line, give and get it, get things across, pushing at the far post from the other side. You know, so I didn't put them down the hurly burly of the middle of the park or the centre forward. Mm. So I learned how to operate with kids and I'd still do that. I mean, I love kids in my side, but I don't like people telling me you must play them too. Mm. What if you haven't got the kids? And you know, at this stage, we haven't got the kids, mm. so it's it's a double-edged sword. Really. I want to take a detour there onto Sean and Rory because Sean, not many people know this, he actually got signed by Liverpool, didn't he? Yeah. He spent three years at Liverpool, went over as an apprentice after mm. shining in the National League as a fifteen-year-old. You were involved in that move. Mm. Looking back now, was that the right place for him to go? Or, you know, is there any sense of? of regret over that move at that time? Oh, a couple of things there. I mean, Sean wasn't the only one who went. There was a lad called Tommy White. He was he went with him as well. And Thomas was a, he'd be a half Mary lad as well. And I, I took them over to, I had a friend there called Mickey Walker, who knew Graham Souness. And I took him over there, sent them over there, because it was like a, a GRE scholarship. Hmm. So they went to, I'd, maybe five maybe five clubs in England so they went for a week a week a week nearly everywhere Sean went he got offered but it was Ipswich he hated Leeds they didn't get offered at Leeds but Ipswich he certainly did and so on and when he got to Liverpool I went to watch him at Melwood and it was a I've got pictures of it actually I'm there with John Barnes and Phil Thompson and I went in there I've got the big overcoat on you know with a scarf on and they, they wanted to sign him and soon as called me in and um, he said, Steve, that's Highway, you know, he was in charge of all time. He, he sort of want, he took them both and he said he'd not seen them play. But uh, end of the day, I mean, I'll never forget it. We watched a game, Jan Mulby was in the middle of the park, never got out of the centre circle and dominated the whole game. Um, great big crowd at Anfield and uh, end of the day, the crowd's pouring out down them. I don't know if you've seen all, like the... It's like Coronation Street outside Anfield. So Sean's there and uh, he'd been there, as I said, for maybe a week. I said, well, that's it, son. Good luck, get stuck in. And he looked at me. He's expecting to go home. I said, no, they want you to stay, Sean. He's only 15. So legally, he was too young. He got me 16. But they took, they said, that six months, 15 and a half, will do him the world of good. Uh, I said, do you know the way back to your digs? And he went, that's him, 15, left left in Liverpool. Wow. You know, mm. he's gone by, all the best, son. Never went back, I don't think I went back again to see him. He survived, you know, and so on, and away he went. And eventually, he got flicked. He went through the fourth team, the Adelaide, and the youth team. Got in the reserves with Robbie Fowler. Mm. Fowler kicked on 
to the first team and Sean didn't. End of that, he got flicked. Up. He must have made a decision and said he's been here three years. We don't think he'll go any further. And he rang me. And the worst thing was it was April Fool's Day and I thought he was having, having me on. But he rang me and he wanted home. So I, I pulled him home. It, it just... I think he lost a little bit after Liverpool. Nothing else was quite right. You know what I mean? So, I could imagine yeah. it'd be quite hard to then bounce somewhere else yeah. after being at Liverpool. But that's his D life. During on. those three years, your obviously your life as football coach. Your son is at Liverpool. Mm. Are you you just bursting with excitement, hoping that he's just going to succeed there? Yeah, but inside me, head was all the disappointments I've had from the game. That don't get too excited because that ultimately can always happen. So I'm all, I'm always prepared for it. Uh, and it's the same in my life, you know, getting flicked. Roy's in coaching now and he's already had his first, you know, bye-bye and then he's bounced back. He's at the Swansea Academy now and you've got to come through it. But, you know, Sean made it. I would say Sean wasn't as dedicated as Rory. You know, Sean was a bit of a lad, a bit like his dad. You know, <laughs> he was a bit of a jack the lad. He didn't really give it. And in, in my years at Rotherham and Southend and Sligo, I could have probably give it another 10%. You know, mm. that, that is a thing that you look back on your life and you think, did you give it everything? You think, well, I used to go out there and, you know, maybe not, just maybe not. I heard an interesting thing that he he signed a contract with you in his formative years yeah. around, he got a stipend to train. It's in my diary. Right, and yeah. a goal bonus and those sorts yeah, of things as well. Everything. So he, he was kind of... Yeah, he's guided. Well, yeah. Mary always says Roy was <laughs> was brainwashed. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, Did Rory sign the same sort of contract yeah, with you? Yeah. Wow! It, it was for t I used to get them, make sure they had tr treatment. They didn't have to go through the public system. If they got injured, I got them treatment. I got them uh, sponsored clothes and um, goal bonuses, training money. You know, the, like the basic was something like five dollars, and it was then appearance and then goals. You know, I thought, fuck it, he's, he's getting me broke here. It's about <laughs> bucks, you know. But, it was all of that, yeah, and they signed a contract with me and they had to get to bed before a certain time and they were up in the morning and they, they got into all that regulation and they got in, because every morning they were up, I don't know, Mary will tell you, probably half past five off we went to training and it was what, quite a commitment. What do you think of that, looking back for someone who's, who's got two young boys, is, would you do that again? Yeah, you've got to put the time in, you know, like, you've got to realise it's less than 1% of British clubs who are actually working at the clubs get signed as a pro. So how good was I sending all them Kiwis? And there's been not just my kids and Tommy White. There's been Chris Booker and Phil John and this Ry Denton. He's probably one of the first ones. It went on and on and on, sending people over there. You know, I mean, how good was it that they got contracts? Mm. It's just amazing yeah. that they come from this little outpost. Mm. Yeah, we'll sign him. They don't do that because of me. They, they want it. And, you know, it's, I don't know who was the most successful. Lee Norfolk got signed at Ipswich. Play, he started, he got a start in the Premier League. He was our first Premier League player. He was one of mine every morning. He was with Rory, wasn't he? He was, he over was on the with Sean. Sean. Oh, Sean. Sean, sorry. Yeah. He's with Sean on the show. Alton Ramadan, he got signed in Turkey, another one. But there's, there's people have, Mary, she has a better retentive memory than me. There's that many of them that got pro contracts. And you don't, there's not that many these days. Mm. You've got to put the time in. You must put the time in. You've got to get up. You've got to train. You've got to have the disappointments. You've got to, you know, you, you've got to get over injuries. It's, it's not an easy life. We, we had Chris James on another episode who spoke really effusively about the Mount Albert Grammar experience mm -hmm. and how that prepared him for yeah. going over and eventually signing for Fulham. He got toughened up. That's kind of what, yeah. he, what he alluded to, that yeah. he wouldn't have done what yeah, he did yeah. without that time at MAG. So... Yeah. I agree. It seems like you've evolved a contract with your sons into replicating a pro environment here in New Zealand out of a high school. And that's what we're talking about when you say about the look and the this and the A. Hey, that's what it's all about. That control. That they'll do it for you because they want to succeed and you want them to succeed. They've got to understand that. You don't, you don't do these authoritarian things because you want to do them, but that's the way we're going to make it. I mean, I see these days coaches go out on the fields and talking to the players who are all gathered around. I can see the players already after five minutes fiddling, yeah? Then they go out and they stop it and they bring them back in and suddenly the hour's work is probably 
35 minutes. Well, my hour's work is probably be an hour and five minutes. Mm. You know, I believe in getting things in there. You don't talk. You know what I'm talking. Talk. How many coaches talk, yeah. talk, fucking talk, stop and stop. Yeah. Who's that all for? Yeah, exactly. Who are they doing it for? They're talking for themselves a lot of the time. You know, that, that, it, that's yeah. not my style. I like to get the work in. Keep yeah. people busy. Maybe give you a little, hey, get on the half turn. Hey, touch tight. It might, it's during the practice it's all happening. Mm. You know, it's, it's oh, fucking touch tight, yeah. Mm. And, or whatever. Do you know what I'm saying? It, it's instant there comments which are going to make me a better player. Get on the half turn, defending. The other day we're doing defending. Players with two feet, you got an angle, so you're half turned. Mm. And push them toward, if I'm working with you, I'll be pushing the big fella towards you. Mm. Why? The concertina him. It's little things. You, you, you didn't allow yourself to get excited when Sean was at Liverpool, because he's 15, 16, you know, he hasn't done anything, he hasn't made it yet. Quite contrasting with Rory when he scored the goal to take the All Whites to the World Cup in 2010. Uh, 2009, when he was right at the end of his career, you know, this was kind of the culmination of all that hard work. Mm. Did you allow yourself to enjoy that moment and how, talk us through that, that evening? Oh, it was a great evening because Fred, Fred de Jong was doing the commentary and when Rory scored, he went quiet. I've never known somebody, he never even announced that Rory Fallon had scored the goal, so I think, oh, bloody hell, not another Fallon. <laughs> and that was de Jong. And De Jong used to be one of my players and I helped him out at Mount Wellington when, you know, at a time when he was struggling. I remember him sleeping, having a rest on Rory's bed mm. at my home. You know, when he was flashing around town in a, like a Dracula overcoat <laughs> and driving him, I think he had a moped, he was flashing behind him. But he, he forgot on the commentary that night that who scored the goal. If you go back to that commentary, I don't know if at the end he said, oh, Rory Fallon scored the goal. <laughs> he was the only one in the stadium not excited because everybody, he took the roof off. And I said to Rory, Rory, you're immortal, mate. you live forever. You know, the number 14 has got the goal, Rory Fallon. He just bought in 12 million into the coffers, which they spent quite quickly. But were you in the stand? Were you jumping up and down, your arms around, your couple of mates there from the 82 team? I Do think I was actually drinking a whiskey in somebody's box. Um, I might have been because uh, I don't I don't stay inside boxes when the games I always go outside to watch the game you know get amongst the crowd so I was outside but uh, I'd had a couple of drinks and because that day it was oh Kevin come in here there's all the boxes and you pop in and pop out and sometimes you say a few words in you know in one box or the other but I was excited I was a very I'm, I was pleased for New Zealand I mean it it, it took a I remember Rory said. Um, before the game, the All Whites walked around the pitch, 82, and he mm. couldn't believe, you know, the sort of um, applause that they got and everybody remembered them. Mm. And that one dominating thought in his mind, we've got to sort of get over this, you know, 1982. You know, we need to build it for ourselves, you know, which they did, mm. you know, because it's, it's, it's gone on too long. It's, it's like now it's, it's getting, it's, it's yeah. happening again. You know. I'd love to read the diary entry from that night though, because reflecting, like that's incredible. <laughs> you were there at the last time New Zealand went to the World Cup, your son has scored the winning goal to take them to the World Cup again. Putting that together, like I said, the end of his career, all yeah. those mornings, I think all those retired trainings. him really early. Mm. Yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, he's getting on though. He um, was a senior player, I don't know how old he was, what, eight, what, 82 till, what was it, 2010, what is it? 18, 28. 28, 28. yeah. In his prime. <laughs> yeah, but, but, it's, it, it, but it's that twenty-eight, thirty-two. You, it's going the other way, isn't it? You know, you just yeah, definitely thirty-five, thirty-six. Yeah. You're finished. I, I finished. I got back with my bad leg at thirty-four, but um, and I was that was it. I mean, I couldn't get in the car. Yeah, <laughs> it is quite unique to have. Uh, I mean, a family name synonymous with two pretty major milestones of New Zealand football history. Yeah, and it's and is that a burden? No, I mean, I think. For me, I mean, it's justified. It just the hard work has reached fruition, and um, it's paid off, hasn't it? Mm. You know, I think you've been rewarded as much as you've put into the game. I mean, seriously, when I, I think about who has put more into football than Kevin Fallon in this country, name me anybody. Mm. They've all been retired for twenty years. You know, I mean, I'm still going, and I mean that. I can say that in all all sincerity, all modesty. Nobody's put more into the game in this country than me. 
Nobody. And you can tell by talking to you the, the, the energy you've still mm. got. Where does that drive come from to keep going? You're still coaching Northern Premier League level, probably the top, well, the top club league in New Zealand and potentially in the National League should they make the top four this season. Where does that drive come from and how will you know when it's time to stop? It's a tough one because I, I do a blog, as you know, I, I've just started doing these sort of poignant pictures and what they mean to me. And the other week I put one in a Jock Steen. I'm sat there having dinner with Jock Steen. And people, you know, if people can't, if people my age anyway, I don't know about you two young fellas, but can't say, oh yeah, look at that, Kev sat in dinner with Jock Steen. He's won the European Cup, the Celtic manager, the Scotland guys, he's massive. And he used to, when I went in the World Cup, he said, Kevin, he'd shout me across. I feel, I'd feel 18 foot 10, you know, Jock Steens, this is in the World Cup, during the World because he was there, as I said, he was, his work, Ferguson was his scout. Yeah. That's how important he was. And um, when, when you look at things like that, that you've got, you've got to that, you know, kind of height in the game, it just, it just blows you away, quietly. Mm -hmm. You know, that you, you've reached that stage where you put things there with people like him, or you, you, you've got, sat down with Brian Clough, and you've been there with Fergie, and it's just brilliant. Mm -hmm. So what people have got to realise is that you don't just become a coach or a manager, you've got to earn the right to be that. It's, uh, and I don't know what your question was. Well, the question was, <laughs> I mean, again, reading back, it was like my whole life is football. It's like yeah. when you were talking about your Gisborne City days, yeah. you were like... I'm 100% I've got family in my health and otherwise it's football and it appears to me like perhaps that's still the case I mean you're, you're now living an hour over an hour away from Manukau training ground and you're going there four days a week um, you've just signed a new contract where does that fire or desire come from and how will you know when it's time to stop doing that why I said to Jockstein he said to me that day Kevin there's a, there's a time to let go and he must have been poor thing died about two years later on a bench he was I sat on the bench and mm. died mm against Wales and I've often said to people um, if I die on the football pitch I'll be happy and smell the grass that'll do you know so I've, I've not rushed to you know to get out of the game I've not intended to stay in the game it's just that I've got the energy and the desire to want to build a team again mm. and I try to throw that onto my players they've got to they've got to have that feeling that I've got the tingling inside that they've got to want to play you know, and that's what it's all about for me. Mm. And it's the feeling, isn't it? It's a feeling. Football's a feeling. And if the feeling goes, and if you know the, the excitement goes, why are you doing it? You know, it's like a tra I don't want to go to training and somebody walk around and think, "What a bloody session that was." Mm. I like think, "Shit, I learned a bit tonight," or "That was this," or like, "What the kids have had in the past." It, Fuck, I didn't. I don't do that again. I remember when he said that to me. <laughs> you know, so you don't. You just do it because it's part of you, yeah. you know, but you hope that it's right and apt and that people will learn something from it. But I don't know when you give up. There is a time. I mean, you think now at 72, you think, fucking hell, 72, fuck me. Yeah. But I don't feel 72. That's the difference. Mm. You know, I mean, I don't feel, I've, I could go up and talk to young kids, have a laugh with them and everything else. And I, and I don't try and throw myself on people. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm not that type of coach, but. So let's take you right back 49 years ago when you first came out to New Zealand. Was the passion there then in 1972? 1972. I came as a player from a man called Alan Vest who knew of me. He, he played for a team called Workshop in the Midland League. But he'd been at places like, I think, Doncaster. and He'd been a sort of a pro but then got flicked and he ended up teaching at Loughborough. And he, was a good, he was a good coach, by the way, Alan Vest. And uh, he, in the middle of a British winter, and I was doing a job, I was, I was working, do you know what a jackhammer is? Like the tool? Yeah. yeah. I was working behind a jackhammer. I know it is something else yeah. as well, but I won't, <laughs> go into, I won't go into that on the podcast. <laughs> down a trench, down a trench with an Irish gang. And it was, uh, it was that cold in the morning, they'd have to get a crowbar to get the jackhammer out of the ground. The frost, it was frosted into the ground. We worked through everything. You go home, and where I lived, it was that cold, there was ice inside the window. Not outside, inside. And this postcard dropped on the map. And it was a young Nick's head, which is like uh, that. Uh, you've got the white cliffs there, and you've got the sea, and then the lovely sand. Young Nick's head in Gisborne. Dear Kevin, 
Audi fans is some sun surfing soccer. It's totally fucking freezing. And he's asking me this. Four months later, I'm in Gisborne. I've yeah. been through all the procedures. A market, New Zealand house. Went to Gisborne. I've asked this of a few people that have come out from the UK. What did you know about New Zealand before that postcard arrived? I went to the library to even look where it was. Right. You know, I mean, I travelled to Spain on a holiday with the, with the Irish team, Sligo Rovers. I've been to Ireland. My dad's Irish. And I travel around England, but I've not been to many places. And to, but when I got on the plane, I just couldn't think, where are we going? I mean, Ireland to England on a plane is probably half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are a day later. But I, did, I jumped off in Hong Kong and decided I'd have a rest. <laughs> I had to get back on it. I got in Gisborne eventually and the people there to meet me all worked out, but oh. No, it was it was some some trip. So coaching started at twenty four. So my notes suggest you took Gisborne City to a Air New Zealand Cup final at yeah. the age of twenty four. Yeah, I did. It takes a certain type of personality to be a coach at twenty four. Incredibly young age. How did you get the respect of the, the team? Well, one of the problems was when you that you know I've always had the what can say the, the personality to take control. Always. I mean, I've always been a leader, I'm not a follower. I think when I played for people, I wanted to. Obviously, with Alan Vest, I did respect him and did my best, but I got injured. When he went, there's no coach sort of in there. And uh, Ian Gillis, who was chief journalist at Gisborne Herald, mm. I played with him when I came across. He was at the end of his career. And uh, as I said, in the Arcus Trophy, I was leading it in the whole country. So I could play. And they knew I could play and I was fit. And they offered me the job, I mean, and I said, yeah, at 24. I'd never took a coaching badge. You know, I'd never done any of that. I'd just come straight out of playing, you know, to take the team. So within that, and within the side, there was people who'd played for Everton, Ray Veal, mm. people like that. That's true, Veal's dad. That is Veal who went to Waikato. Yeah. And Ken Dugdale, who ended up all white coach. So that, that, that particular night when I hit Dugdale and decked him, in a five-a-side game, two national coaches got the future national coaches got the bullet that day because they got rid of him and got rid of me. Yeah, can we can we get into that? Yeah. Because you're you're mid twenties, you've got this team of incredibly sort of experienced guys around. You're Ken Dugdale, one of them. Ray Veal. Ray Veal. You're getting sacked because of a puncture. Is it is that just a five-a-side game and it's just a few tackles flying in, or is there a bit of background to that? No, it's not. I, I used to like Dugdale actually. You know, Doug Dale was okay by me. He's a Liverpool lad, no, no problem. But um, he was, I was refereeing the game. I wasn't playing then, I was the coach. I was actually, and he'd come on with this comment, you're about as good a referee as you are coach. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, what did you say? He said, you heard him, him bang, he left hook, he went, and he dropped, he went down. Yeah. He went down and then people jumped in. and He, he was down and he's gone. And he went to the committee and probably quite rightly so, the committee fired us both. That's what happened. And Bill took over, you know, but... Um, Did he feel quite hard done by getting fired for getting punched in the face? Or? Well, yeah, but he was insulted, I suppose. <laughs> 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 he, did, he did well enough. He went to stop out and did OK, I think. And then he eventually coached New Zealand. He didn't do bad, did he? Everything worked out on the night. It's quite he? a big call, though. He no, was actually no, a friend. <laughs> yeah. N normally they would choose one, wouldn't they? Yeah, They've got yeah. these two huge personalities. Yeah. so important. You, yeah. You're going to go with one or the yeah. other. Like, get rid of both of them. That's what they did, which is a bad mistake, I think, for the club. And I think Veal took over. He didn't do an out with them, but um, he took over. Over. And what's your what's your fondest memory from your time in Gisborne? Meeting my wife. Ah. <laughs> As me, he comes into the background and uh, starts making some sandwiches. <laughs> no, I, I love Gisborne. You know, I, I never forget when when I got to Gisborne, I was walking around like this all year. You know, it was such a great place. The beaches, the people. You know. It, there's more than that. I mean, the, the, the social life. It was a surfy town when we were there. Lots of Australian surfers there. Parties galore. If at the weekend you saw a house and it had 10 cars outside, it was a party, you'd knock on the door. If you got a bit of grow, yeah, come in and let you in. I mean, it was one of them places. It was lovely. Mm. So a lot of people used to go from party to party till they found the girlfriend. I mean, it's <laughs> it was just an amazing place. I mean, and I, I loved it, as I said. I mean, who wouldn't like it? I'd go there now, but... Uh, 
I bought out in the country. Yeah. How different was it the second time around when you went back when the Russian the Russian millionaire was backing the project? Well, I was quite pleased because I had me on plane. <laughs> yeah. They used to shout at the airport, this is no word of a lie. Mr. Fallon, your plane's ready now. <laughs> And I take some of the mags yeah. for the day. Yeah, they, 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 they speak they very fondly of those, yeah, yeah. of those days. But <laughs> but from a football context that had kind of, it had gone way yeah. down from the glory yeah. days. So going back, yeah. the, had the gloss gone off it slightly? Yes. Well, I think things were happening in them days, like eventually they lost the club rooms and the crowd had stopped coming and nobody charged anymore. They didn't have a programme. It was so professional, you know, when I was there as a young player. And don't forget, in the 80s, I went back and won the National League there. Mm. You know, that's never happens in this country. You know, you, that's not happenstance, and it's certainly not luck. Mm. You, you've got to have the ability to govern, coach, and have the players to do the job, and we did that. You know, it's just an amazing feat, and I said, great days. I had some fabulous days there, but it, it takes a lot to get back to that. You know, people took over, and it flopped, and there's been some... Big names, this is like Veal, Sumner, they've all tried. Mm. Walker came back, couldn't make it happen. Mm. You know, it's, it's not easy what we did in the 80s. Well, in 79, we won the Central League unbeaten mm. and ended up in the penultimate game without our top striker, Richard Dawson, who got all the goals against the next top club, Miramar. It ended up in that kind of game. Whoever won it on the day was through. Martin Ryan got sent off, we're down to 10 men. Somebody had a penalty and missed it. You know how you're feeling now. And then suddenly, Buzzer popped up at the edge of the box and got the goal. And we won 1 0. And so I think we, that year we played 18, won 10 and drew 8, yeah. unbeaten. Again, not luck, is it? Yeah. You know, but we got them into the National League and then said second, and maybe two, couple of years later, champions. So, so another interesting passage from your Gisborne time from this book was. I think maybe after your fourth year there, um, John Edshead gives you a call and sort of drives you to Auckland. You think that you're getting the call up as a player. He didn't originally. drive me. He come to visit and he, it, got, he actually got drunk that night. Right. But but yeah. it's, it sold it as you were a bit surprised that, well, the first thought was I'm getting called up to the All-Whites as a player and then realised it's actually you want to do as an assistant coach. So you were still playing at a level then when you, yeah. you seriously thought that, you know, an All-Whites cap was... And the All-Whites were struggling. They were getting donged. You know, going on tours and getting hammered. In Scotland, I think they got beat six or seven, one in against one side, and they were struggling. And there was a bit of upheaval in the camp. And um, John, is, this, is this 1980, 81? It should be when I first went to. It'd be 80. Right. 1980. But Dempsey told. This was the real story. Apparently, Dempsey told John to go and get Kevin Fallon. John always denies that, but I don't know the truth of it all, but um, that's how it worked out. And then suddenly I'm, we're with them, and the first night, the big night, we beat Mexico with about four Gisborne City players in the side that had not played before. 4-0 mm. at Bill McKinley? 4-0. So right? yeah. yeah, and they had some good players playing for them too, if you follow that team. But it was cold, it was a cold night. Mm. But it, it just went from there, and, and me and John... We developed as a partnership and a duo and, you know, everything. Yeah, what was the division of labour like at the World Cup between you and John? In, in what respect? Or even the lead, the lead up and the whole, the well, whole journey? Well, were you, were you on the field, you know, you were doing the sort of the team. I coached, he, he, was, he was the manager. Yeah. I coached. I mean, I was the coach. He was the manager. They put me down as assistant coach, but that's bullshit. I mean, I was the coach and John was the manager and he was a good manager. You know, he, he, he sort of... John had the kind of personality that can pull people together and um, it, when I first went with him, and he, he's forever cracking jokes, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's actually a comedian. Yeah. He worked the clubs in England. Did you know that? No, I didn't know Yeah, that. he did. Yeah. He's like a Les Dawson. Have you ever heard of Les Dawson? No. I feel, like he's, like, I feel like he's referenced in one of the office for extras. He's a northern, <laughs> Les Dawson's a northern comedian. Right, like from the northern Yorkshire, where we're from, Liverpool, Lancashire, all that. He's got all these, and he's really trolling. Mm -hmm. And John was like, that. John's a terrific after dinner speaker. He was a good manager, uh, but you know, with all due respect, I did the coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, 
we, we were talking a little bit about this on the way out. Young Winton Rufer, who was obviously part yeah. of, of your crew, was he head and shoulders? About, I mean, he was young at, at that stage. Did you coach him much after that when he was in his prime? What happened with Rufer? He came to Childers Road with a team, and for the life of me, I can't, was it Miramar? Could have been Miramar, the team, like the WDU. It's one of the Wellington teams anyway, and uh, it won't go off his. And he did this unbelievable thing at um, Childers Road. It might have been scoring a goal. And it was a bit of a look up and see and a vision thing and clip the keeper who might have been on the edge of the box. That was Don Finlayson who eventually went on into Wellington for Barry Truman and played for New Zealand. And I was marking him. And I said, you lucky bastard. He looked at me and he said, I meant it. <laughs> In all innocent, I meant it. And I felt, did you? <laughs> and I, th I said, I went back and said, we've got to get Rufa. We've got to get him in the side. And, you know, I mean, we got him in the side. And then eventually he did so well in, you know, in Germany and became a top player, player of the century or something, wasn't he? Mm. Yeah, but did you see that in his prime? You know, did he come back and play for the All Whites match when he was at, at Bremen? He came back. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I, I can't. I, I can't remember the detail from all those years ago, but he did come back and then eventually Shane was in, had his little spell in the side as well and um, he was never any problems. I mean, Winton had always, you know, come back and play if he could. They can't always get back, can they? No. But he he did make it, if you remember when we put him in, it was his was his first game the big one in Singapore? Was that his first game? Oh, yeah. Did we throw him in then? Mm. Or did he play just before that? I mean, I'm, I'm not too sure about it. He played before she married Ross. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, I'm just kind of sitting here reflecting and doing the math. You're on a jackhammer in 1972. I was actually sho shoveling behind the jackhammer. <laughs> but that's, no, that's 1972. Um, Ten years later, yeah, I'm in a, Spain. a team that you're coaching is walking out, yeah. playing Zico, yeah. Socrates, yeah. you're playing Sunis, those guys, Scotland, the USSR and Brazil. In your wildest dreams, when that postcard arrived, yeah. did you ever think you'd be at the pinnacle of world football 10 years later? No, when I got there, I thought, I don't half miss that jackhammer. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a meteoric rise. It's pretty, it's pretty crazy to think you can go from that yeah, to that. You've always got to think around the corner, you know, England next week, Wembley next week. I mean, you've got to think that, haven't you? You've got to be optimistic. Hmm. You know, and it's, it's that, that kind, that kind of for me, good luck has followed me all my life. I mean, if you keep working and keep your head down and keep positive, that things look. I, I think things might work out. Hopefully this year. Hopefully we'll have a team. We haven't got one at the moment. But, <laughs> you know, but but then but then post World Cup, is it then hard to get up from the highs of no, Spain '82 no. to then continue through? I felt just as happy. Winning things for Gisborne City, there you are. Or whatever, winning things for Mount Albert Grammar School. I was just as happy as, you know, I mean, if, if, when I think back, if, if people said to me, was that the sort of penultimate achievement? I said, well, I don't know, maybe winning the league in Gisborne was just as good. Mm. It was more prolonged and mm. it meant a lot to me, you know, for that town and them people. Winning 31 trophies at Mount Albert Grammar School in 14 years. I used to love that. They've not won a thing since this me. Yeah, let, let's um, mo let's move on to yeah. to Mags. You made the decision to then step away from senior football coaching to focus on school coaching. Was that a tough decision to make? Is it, that how it worked? It a decision. It's what was offered. You know, at the time, I was I was sort of looking a bit dodgy. I thought. I mean, I don't, can't remember where where I came from in two thousand and fourteen. I'd have to get them diaries out, but. <laughs> <laughs> the almanac, the almanac in the background. Hey, hey, see? I got the sack from Central. That was a good night as well. Ivan didn't know how to sack me. <laughs> Talk us through he offered, what, he what offered, happened. He offered, it was very furtive round Kiwi Tear Street. I'd had, a, I'd had a running with about six or seven dallies and the, and the groundsman and everybody else. And he actually called me to, to his office upstairs and said, uh, how would you like a double? Oh, yeah. In whiskey, we'll have one, yeah. Oh, this is an unusual one. And then a lady told me. <laughs> he sacked me. And then, but he sorted everything out. I mean, it's all done in an orderly fashion with a contract and everything else. Just like Waikato was. Yeah. I think um, the Waikato lawyer, I can't remember his name. 
but it's all sorted out and eventually I'm now moving on to Mount Elbert Grammar School and that was the best thing on offer yeah and then I tried to make something a bit more professional out of you know out of school football as opposed to the, the slipshod way that it had gone on before we had a scouting system we looked in Oceania for players and the net was spread wide and I only used to gather if we needed a left back at inside a centre forward I found my best left back you know that type of thing yeah and um, I had my systems and put them in place and I'd all made well before Declan was putting up his signs there were signs around that you know around that dressing rooms and mm. school and yeah, you created a real beast I mean I grew up I was in high school during your mags era yeah and the aura coming from that school and the players was just incredible national tournament it was like mags yeah. were just this machine yeah. this Kevin Fallon machine um, and like you say, 30 local and national titles, 31, 31. 31 uh, across 14 years. But I'll tell you something, just before, and you can please carry on after this. I looked up at, at the mags at the board, I looked at things, and thought, God, that coach must have been brilliant in them days. There was a coach, he'd won, I thought, shit, this is oh, back in the 20s. I thought, I don't want to better that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I did, because he was that good. Yeah. But it was that kind of run that I had, you know, win, 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 win. I used to say to the rugby guy, he used to always be the man with, I said, I'm running out of polish for these cups, can you get me a bit more? He used to really piss him off. Eddie Wilson, his name was. But uh, they'd not won a thing for years and years and years. And we went in there and won all that. They've not won a thing since. And my name was becoming eponymous with Mount Albert Grammar School. I think that's what was upsetting. It became Kevin Fallon's Mount Albert Grammar. Mm. I think that upset the headmaster, which yeah. he thought it was his. Yeah, which leads us to July 2014, front page of New Zealand Herald, Kevin Fallon. That's sat. amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. And, yeah. and in the report at the time, it said, his departure follows an alleged sideline incident involving an opposing school, the facts of which are disputed. Kids were gutted, they wore black armbands, they threatened a mass walkout, they boycotted games, which is pretty unprecedented. Um, and it also went on to say it was alleged Fallon swore at the opposing coach late in his team's 4-1 win over Westlake Boys High, something Fallon vehemently denies. So reflecting now, um, and this leads me to my question. So I've been canvassing opinion in the lead up to this of, of those who know you well. Um, in the mags days, I played against you, some who loved you, some who hated you. And it's been quite an interesting journey, really. You're, you're an incredibly polarising figure. Um, I've got good friends whose opinions I trust on both sides. One who says sort of across 20 plus years of working with you closely, he's only seen maybe one or two indiscretions, which were perhaps understandable in the heat of battle. Another who said he saw you overstep the mark with abhorrent behaviour for schoolboy football on numerous occasions. So it's, it's really hard to get a clear picture of exactly what happened and who's right and who's wrong. But now when you reflect on your sideline, and I'll call it sideline behavior because no one I spoke to questioned your footballing pedigree. You know, what you had footballing was, was the pinnacle, was what everyone aims to have. But there are questions about the sideline behavior. Now, reflecting on that passage and the way it ended, do you have any regrets? No, because I think there comes a time and I've said it before, when, when Steen said to me, there's always a time to leave Kevin. But he always said to me the other thing, you can't beat experience. And that's what he said about the coaching initially, but they're the two things that stick with me. I'd been there a long time and it came to an end. And what had happened, all the things I've... I'll give you some examples of little things. I did a newsletter, well before the Headmaster's newsletter, and I got it sponsored and everything else. I got all the kits sponsored. He took over them projects. He started cutting everything but from below your feet. Suddenly there's no, no, nothing for the newsletter. He did one. It's so boring. If I wanted to get some sleep, I'd pick up the headmaster's newsletter and I'd drop off in the first paragraph. And then he started selling the lotto stuff in the shop. So they got all the cop from that, which we used to get towards the football, towards the budget and everything else. So they start cutting things from underneath your legs, you, you, you know what I mean? You can't move anywhere, and this, that, and the other. So, doors started closing that were originally open. So it's obviously, you know, it's obvious that he wanted to. And when it, when the time come, the time come. May maybe in life things are always heading down that highway. Maybe it was inevitable that you you, you can't avoid it. It's always going to happen. It was going to build to that, and it did. 
and it, for the slight, I would think the slightest, I mean, if they're talking about a few expletives, there's always a few expletives with me. I mean, it'd be gone on for 14 years. Nothing, no big deal. It might be, oh, for fuck's sake. Under your breath, but it was never at the kids. You know what I mean? The kids basically you talk to them. And it, 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 if there was a swear word, it's not because you're swearing. It's just a bit like Arthur Rowley, isn't it? Fucking hell. Mm. I mean, it's one of them. So I didn't regret it in the end. I mean, it's a bit of shock, but I bounced back from it. You know, but that's it. I mean, you bounce back and I have bounced back. They've not bounced back. How, what do you think about the division of people who reflect on you as the coach? Because, like I said, we've had probably half yeah. a dozen people on this podcast. Or most of them have played for you at Mags. You know, I'm talking Ross McKenzie, uh, Jeremy Christie, we had... There's another um, pro, Mulligan, another pro. Mm. They just keep going. Yeah, so, so they all speak so highly of you, like that you've helped shape them into the people they are. But then some others, and, and to be fair, it is all opposition, you know, teams that were competing against Auckland Mags <laughs> at that time. A lot of Auckland grammar guys. Yeah, exactly. And they are so passionate in their opinion that your behaviour was totally unacceptable. Oh, well, that's them, isn't it? They're always the same. You'll never change that one. Well. You know, it's like that all the time. I mean, all these... I mean, half that lot, when I went to Eastern Suburbs, I got rid of them again. You know, they're on the Eastern Suburbs, sta you know, playing staff. When I got there, I got shut of them all, and then ruffled to this day. You know, he, he said, the re I mean, the reason they took me to Eastern Suburbs at the end of the day was to clear clear everybody out, which I did. I remember that, actually. I he said, it's my suburbs. intestinal fortitude. You know, that got rid of them all. That was his phrase he used. Yeah. But, you know, there were a lot of Auckland Grammar players there at that club, Eastern Suburbs, you know, over that over that Mission Bay area, and they went to Auckland Grammar. And, yeah. You know, there, there's a pattern to it, and... Them kind of players are never going to play for me anyway. You know, I mean, what have they done? A lot of them players, how many of them have achieved professional football and, and this, that and the other? And maybe we're looking at different aims and ambitions. And when I took kids to Mags, I wanted to get winning ways and teach them how to, you know, how to be a footballer if they were good enough. And a lot of them did that. Mm. But you can't say a lot of them. I mean, the team I left behind with Liam Jordan, Max Matter, and, and you're telling me I won't win the league? Just be joking, and they didn't win the league, and we're, we're up there, but it wouldn't. It? But they've who's, who's come from the other side? How many of these people that you're talking about have been professional football players? They're probably doctors or solicitors or accountants. Or, think about it. Yeah, but I, I don't think their what they achieved in football needs to influence how they can judge someone's behaviour. I think when it comes from when you sat there, you know, in an ivory tower. You know, and you're always spoilt and you've always got your three meals a day and you've never known what it's like not to eat. Uh, you've got a different outlook on life than somebody who's been behind jackhammers in the, in the middle of the English winter. Mm. You know, I mean, for, for me, it's different. I mean, I'm, I can mix in any kind of crowd and people. And I don't know if they can. You know, I can. You know. It, it, we spoke about the Mags principal, um, headmaster, what are you going to call him? It seemed like he had your... Back. Yeah, he was very supportive of you for a long period and then sort of in that last year or that last incident it, it just sort of yeah because I beca I've become as I said my name my, my, as soon as you mentioned Mount Talbot Grammar School there's Kevin Farr. right so, so, and he, I think he, at the end of the day to be honest he was getting jealous he wanted him to he wanted to be part of that I mean and he's the boss you know he's the boss he decides what he's going to do you know, he made a decision and his decision has cost them winning trophies. They've never won a thing since, but they're happy enough in their little world, you know. Might be a, a tough question for you to answer, but looking back across those 14 years, is there a player, a high school player, and I'm not necessarily saying someone who went on to have a career, but is there a high school player? Because I've got a name in my head who I remember as the mag superstar, Prince Kwanzaa. But is there, <laughs> said it. Is there someone who you can pick out of that incredible period, who was just the best high school player you worked with? I don't think I could actually, because there's that many good kids, and you've mentioned Prince, I mean, I think the world of him. You know, he was one who we dragged, dragged into that side, and he loved it. We put him in the schoolhouse, and you know, I mean, fantastic. There's kids come, as I said, from the Solomons, there's kids come from Fiji. We started looking at Oceania people, they still do. Mm. But, you know, I wouldn't like to 
there's probably been a few professional, which there has been heaps of professional footballers, but whether anybody's been the best, they're all, all left at different times and they all worked hard for the shirt and, the, you know, they were great players. And most of them would love the time at Mags, I'll tell you. You know, it was a, it was a great time in their lives, you know, getting up in the morning and working hard. And they had a great team spirit. And as you said, Pete, you go to national tournaments and there's Mags. Max. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, it cost us sometimes. I said the day we took the plane, we didn't win the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I should have sent it by road. <laughs> but you know, it's, I had a lot of fun there. I, I wouldn't like to go back and knock it and say I didn't enjoy it because I did. You know, it was a. It, it didn't end well, that's for sure. Uh, but I did love it. I loved it. With it. And the involvement with the players was fantastic. And as I said, to see a kid walk in the school, and if I. I used to watch all the trials and if I saw year nine and I went up to him and said you can start doing a couple of days a week with the first team so I'll see you on Tuesday and he's there trying to hang in and he didn't do all the running he used to tell him to do one and walk one and then we'd join in the, you know, the ball work he used to love it yeah. and imagine a nine year old knocking the ball with Jeremy Christie and you know because mm. he could play I mean he didn't bring black, bad players in I'd bring good players in and they had to have the attitude and have that little look in the eye, that steely look in the eye that we wanted to do things, you know. Mm. So it, it all worked out pretty good. I, I loved everything. I mean, I loved it. Well, it don't put me off the fact that I'm not there and that happened. These things, there comes a time. I've said that to you about five times in this interview. Mm. There comes a time when you're time to go. Mm. Was that one of the hardest endings of a coaching stint, the Mags one, and when you look back? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was a... It was a and as you said, I mean, it ended up on the front page of the New Zealand Herald. Was it the headline? Yeah, it was the front page of the paper. I mean, yeah. for God's sake, who, who does that? Who, you know, people were Stephen. shouting out a car. <laughs> Stephen does that. That's, that's, that's actually his job. job. No, it was. But it was a big story, wasn't it? I don't know why it got that big, but it's... I remember people wrote in... Well, because of the, the, like we say, because of the profile you had yeah. built up, everyone knew Kevin Fallon's Max. It was, it was a big deal. So for a coach to get, a high school coach to get sacked was... Unheard of, right? The big newsworthy event. It's unheard of if it was a Kelston coach who's got fired, nobody would know. It was because it was... Because of your profile, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. It was... People were shouting out of cars that morning. You know, they, they'd obviously seen it and everything else. And I mean, I'd go walking with Mary in the morning sometimes. But they were shouting out of cars and everything. And, you know, I mean, it's... It took in a lot of people, a lot of time and a lot of places and faces and... Phew, it's a bit. I was a year out of the game after that. I didn't get a mm. job straight away. 2015, I didn't work. So it took the next year to roll over. I don't know why. What did that diary look like? <laughs> <laughs> Got to find it first of all. Yeah. <laughs> but, I don't know. I did miss it. I did miss it. I mean, not not so much mags. I miss football. Full stop. It didn't have to be mags. But you can't come through that and say you didn't enjoy Max because I did, mm. you know. But it, I think it's possibly the things I used to do when I used to keep, I'd be in my little office near the gym. You remember that little office? Yeah, there? yeah. I'd be on the phone and the deputy head McKinley would be knocking on the door and I'd just turn to him and go, just wait there while I finish this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think that brushed him off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think he was too happy with that one, you know. Just bide your time or something. <laughs> Uh, I think he's a headmaster now, isn't he? Headmaster of Glenfield? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Um, I'm going to change tack a little bit now. Um, I actually asked the old man, Bruce Holloway, who's, who's sort of followed you very closely and written a lot about you over the years, if he had any questions. And I don't know if you're going to want to answer this one because it might put you on the spot a bit. So let's just fire away and we'll see where we go. He says, there's been 12 different All Whites coaches since you left the post in 1988. Ian, Ed said, Ian Marshall, Bobby Clark, Keith Pritchett, Joe McGrath, Ken Dugdale, Mick Waite, Ricky Herbert, Neil Emblin, Anthony Hudson, Fritz Schmidt and Danny Hay. Who has been the best and who's been the worst? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's one of the foreigners hardly did anything, did he? He came and went and disappeared. Was that Fritz? Fritz, yeah. Fritz, yeah. yeah. So he, he's really... And I think if you look at the rest, I think Herbert's results, you, you couldn't look past them three. You know, I mean, if I had got, who was it, Paraguay, 
Italy, he played Italy, mm. and they, I think first up. And they second, were, second. Were they second were they? Slovakia first. Slovakia, Italy, Paraguay, was it? Correct. But they were world champions when he played them. Yeah. Just, um, I mean, I've said to him, amazing results, absolutely amazing. I'd be so proud of him if I got them three results. Mm. You know what I mean? So you've got to say, Herbert, for me, yep. you know what I mean? His, his, his results were just outstanding. There you are. Can't look past that. Three, it was the only unbeaten side at the World Cup. Even the World Cup winners lost. Mm. And, then the, and they had that little film, didn't they? Undefeated. That's right. You know. But you could, well, what do you guys think? You can't look past that, can you? I don't think so. Anyway. Fritz, me. <laughs> She's a big Fritz. So I pick Fritz and Ricky, aren't I? <laughs> Um, did you have uh, do you have relationships with I mean Danny Hay now obviously is is very uh, early into his tenure but guys like Fritz Schmidt and Anthony Hudson did they come and and seek your they came they saw and disappeared no, I never, no, I never know I mean Anthony was good at talking about his dad you know was a good player but um, no I, I don't I don't think I've had contact with with none of them actually not one of them. No, does that does that upset you? No. Do you think no? That's... And I, if they think you know they, they need a special problem and they, you know, I mean they never have, they've obviously got other mentors. You know that's life. Mm. I wouldn't want to stick me or in you know, and particularly when I had his son involved with some of it. Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, and now he's part of the coaching staff, of course. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's another it's another Fallon link. It is, but he's got. A, I said he paddles his own canoe, and he's got. He's, he's he's had ten times better football career than I had. You know, in England, God, he's had so many appearances, and he, I don't think any, a Kiwi's any got anywhere near him. Have you? No, that'd be anybody. Hard, for, for, hard pressed to find one. For yeah. The games mm. between Championship, Scottish Premier League, and Div Two. Yeah. Because mm. he he's never, he's never played Premier, mm. but he's played the rest. Mm. And he's played Scottish Premier. But he's had a great career. I mean, his playing career was... Nobody's got no... Nobody, I mean, nobody's got anywhere near it. Who would be the next one? Rufo, of course, he, he was on a different... Woodsy yeah. will be going close Woodsy, eventually. Woodsy, yeah, and he's... And he's and yeah. Woods is a different level as well. He's done yeah. ever so well. Yeah. Looking great, yeah. But I don't think any of the old school have got anywhere near that. When you think of all the old ones, Ricky, yeah. Who, who are the um, fellow coaches in New Zealand that you respect the most today? Oh, it's a tough one there because I'm, I don't have a lot of contact with them. You know, I don't, mm. I, I don't see a lot of coaches, you know, work. And During my era, I always believe in life that you get a leg up sometimes from people. People help you. And all the times that I've been looking for a club and fired and one thing and another, there's always like a little way shower comes and refreshes you and, and gives you a leg up. And there's been a few people, for instance, Alan Vest. You're down there working away, you're playing part-time football in the Southern League, Filterston Town, it's a misery. And suddenly he asks you, do you want that with that postcard I told you about? Mm -hmm. Well, that was a leg up. And when I got here, you know, Vest, he was a, he was a good coach, he was tidy. And then you run into people like Ian Gillis, who've been, you know, really, really shrewd. You know, he's a he's been the editor of the Gisborne Herald for years and years. But as a football man, he was he's a Celtic fan, and he's come from pro football very briefly. And you know, he, he offered all his knowledge as well. And other people, Barry Truman. When I mean, think about Barry Truman as a coach, he could coach, and he, he definitely helped me along the way. So mm. there's, and in his own way, Charlie Dempsey, John Adzed. Yeah. And all them people, I mean, they took me on board. John, when somebody says, whoever decided anyway, that it was him or Dempsey, I'm there. And he's took on and it worked out. Mm. And there's been basically people, you know, people in recent times. I mean, Ronnie Fowler, he was the chairman of the club. Mm. He, he took me to Manukau from his mm. experience of me at Mags, obviously, as my captain. You know, so there's been this, and I'm probably I'm probably missing out some people, but there's been a, quite a number of people who've helped. You know, give me a little leg up along the way. Honey's one of the great characters of the game. He in, is now in, in the modern era. He is now. Um, do you think our sport kind of lacks that in modern day? 
football? I always thought characters Oni, and personalities. I thought yes, I do, but I thought Oni was heading for Parliament. Yeah. <laughs> he might still. He might still. Is he not? <laughs> That's what I always start with Oni. I'm going to see him yet in Parliament, but he's certainly a different. He gets a different tack to me. He doesn't have any head on collisions, does he? No. But he's done a great job. Ho Holly's got to be one of the guys who has the biggest contrast of off field to on field. Yeah, Hone on field, especially during those high school sort of early 20 years, he was a mean defender. Was, yeah, oh, yeah. God, he was rough and tough. He'd do anything to get the ball. He didn't care. But he wouldn't be dirty. He well, won't, for me, he wasn't dirty. was hard. Well, yeah, I yeah. hated playing against yeah. him. Yeah, because he'd run, he'd run yeah. straight, straight through you. But then off the field, the softest, yeah. most yeah. genuine, yeah, you yeah. know, heartfelt guy. It's, it's an incredible... There's a couple of things there. I mean, when you were, you were young... You didn't wake up in the morning and say, oh, fucking great, we've got Mags and Oni Fowler. No. <laughs> Did you ever wake up in the morning and go, right, we've got, well, no, Auckland Grammar is the obvious one that screams out, like, I can't wait for the Grammar game, or any, during your time at Gizzy, did you circle a fixture and go, I can't wait for this one, I can't wait to lock horns with Rog or no, you know, whoever? Because at the end of the day, no matter who you play, it's three points in it. You know, it doesn't matter. I don't think did Mel will ever beat us. They've been a cow. I don't think they did. Yeah, no, we got one. Mark Evans hat trick up there. <laughs> that, was, that was the week after the Orland brawl, so you didn't have a team. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, do you watch much National League yeah. these days? And, and how does the standard compare to the 70s and 80s? I think it's. It's not bad, but the excitement's not there. I mean, I can remember coming from England in the 70s, running out at Newmarket Park, turning round, there'd be 8,000 there on the terrace, on the terrace alone. You know, people now turn around and say, well, all them things, oh, they're people. I mean, they don't, they don't get many people watching now, even when you go to any match, the excitement's not there, the press is not there. It used to be an eight o'clock. After, after the games on a Saturday in Auckland, there was a paper called eight o'clock. It got reports on the game that you just played in. Mm. You know, I mean, it's all that's gone. You don't see as much advertising. You don't see many people. It's it, they seem to be slipping up a lot. But days. the standard of the football itself, I don't think it's much better than what we used to coach in the eighties. When I had Meacock, McLaughlin, Walker, Grant Turner, Mackay, Creswell, that would take some beating watching that lot play. You know, and, then, and they were they were fit. I can tell you that now. We were all tested and fit, and so they weren't fitter today than they were then, that's for sure. And I don't think they're any better because that, that lot went to the World Cup finals. You know, mm. I, I think it's probably not got any worse. There's probably there's a parity there, but it's not better. Ooh, I don't think it's improved. What, what do you think of the changes, the, the uh, mm. underage player rule aside? Do you like the direction that it's going no. with this new competition? I think the new competition now, the next big one is that uh, do you want to finish off the rest of you? Once they've got the top four, do the rest of you want to finish off the league? That's the one they've just put. Well, why would you want to finish off the league when there's nothing at stake? Or is it because, oh, well, it's a game of football? Mm. You know, I mean, it's, oh, you can go down. <laughs> you, so if you're in a position. It's just a relegation battle. Yeah, fifth. <laughs> Yeah. Let's say you're fifth, but you're not going to go to the top four. Yeah. But you play the rest, and it's very tight. You could end up going down. Well, why would you want to continue? Mm -hmm. And I said to the person asking me, "Tell him that if we're at the bottom, we'll carry, carry yeah, on. Carry on. <laughs> the top will stop." <laughs> Is that where they're at in the process? They're yeah, asking the yeah. clubs. No, they're asking they the clubs. Yeah. yeah, fifth to twelfth, continue playing. Now think about it. So if I'm up there and I've just missed out, but it's a tight league. Oh, let's say I'm here. Yeah, and there's them four there, and it's two. I'm two up above that, or whatever. You said no, surely. But they have to find relegation candidates somehow. Yeah, so otherwise, it. it would just yeah. Be but they could do it then. The... Just chop it yeah, off there. Okay. We finished. We played how many games? Uh, Eighteen. No, twenty-two. Twenty-two. Yeah, that's enough. Yeah, because you'd, you'd end up being playing till Christmas or something. I mean, you're playing that long. Yeah, Mid-November mm. is the proposal. Yeah. Does it excite you though the prospect of getting Manukau into the National League? Like, is that, oh, for sure. That's got to be a, a that, carrot. That, that's a plus. Yeah. That suddenly, if you're a good side, you could play in the World Club Championship. That, that's a massive. Any any team now can get that. That's good. But I don't think we should be bringing the under twenty rule in, and we, should, we shouldn't be restricting the reserves to 
I believe it's now, it was originally, I was told this, but it's probably wrong, all, all under 23 the reserves, but now I believe there's five overage players allowed in it. Okay. Which is obvious because if somebody, you know, a senior player who's been injured, say he's 28, where well, am I going to bring him back? 35 put him in the, or 35. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll put him in the reserves, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. I can't. But yeah. apparently I can now. And this is the other thing is, the rules don't seem to be set in concrete. You know, they, they seem to be changing and they, they're they wondering what to do with things and they're asking opinions and asking the clubs. And mm -hmm. I just think, you know, they, they, football's football. Put the best players in on the day. And yeah, maybe you've, I've got to restrict your imports. You mm. can't bring 10 from England. But I think, you know, if, if you look at, there's no restrictions on the Premier League, is there? No. You know, and that's the best football in the world. Mm. And that's what you've got to try and emulate, I think, not not try and sort of put everything in little boxes and, yeah. So I don't like the way it's going at the moment. I, I think they've got to get back to forget all the rules and this, this sort of, you, before the game, you have to fill a, in quadruplicate, like a catalogue out. Mm. And it's got to be in by a certain time. In the old days, we had a team card, one to 11, there's your subs, put them out, he's got booked, he's got, put a stamp on it and gone. Mm. So literally on a white postcard. With the FA's address on the front, you put your stamp on it. That was it. Yeah. I mean, you, there's no regulations. I mean, that was it. Simpler time. Mm. I wanted to touch on the Under-17 World Cup in 99, which was a big... For me, it was a watershed for in my kind of my life. I was not good enough to be selected, obviously. No. Um, which is a shame. But you coached the first team to get a result at, yeah. a, at, a, at a FIFA youth event as well. How great was it coaching a national team, a national age group team in front of a home crowd? That's conveniently forgot by a lot of people too. That I was the first coach to win in a World Cup situation, actually a game. You know, get some get something out of it or draw whatever we did. I think we did beat Poland, Poland two one, and, beat, and they were European champions. Not bad, eh? Mm. That was Mulligan and company, yep. and I think Sean was in it. And it was that. I think it was that mob. No, she said no. no Sean wanted yeah, it. Was it. Rory. it was Rory. Was Rory it? was that, but Rory wanted it. No, but no. he was the, that was that was his, that was his generation. <laughs> so it was Pierce his, it was his and Malaga. He played for England. Yeah, Christie. Yeah. <laughs> he played for England. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a Mags boys. Tony Lockhead. Yeah. Yeah. It was a Mags yeah. boys. Yeah, Rainer. Yeah, Sasha Natu. Yeah, it was a good side. Daniel Trent. Mm. Yeah, Daniel was there. Yeah, Sanjay Singh was my favourite. If we're going to go, good gonna, lad. Gonna, he was a good lad. He was a good lad. Naming names, but you yeah. see, again, when we're getting down to the nuts and bolts, I'd have to research because there's so much happened in my life. But I do remember the euphoria of that quietly inside of getting a victory against England, you know, against Poland because yeah. they'd obviously beat Rory's lot because he was playing for England. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, 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 I didn't say to him, "Take England." If he'd have said I'm coming back there to play for you, yeah. but it, it took England. <laughs> they got dumbed, and we beat the team who won it. Because at USA, we played New, uh, USA in the opening game, and that opening night was electric in that yeah. stadium. It was incredible. It was nice. And I remember thinking, like these, I played against these, yeah. Pritchard and all those yeah. guys. What were our results? USA lost two one. Two one, very close game, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, that Mali got sent off. Yeah, ended up with 10 men and that centre forward scored. He, he had a good career. Demarcus Beasley or Landon Donovan. I think they're both, Donovan. They're both Donovan. scored in the game. Yeah, it was rapid. Really. They had careers, didn't they? They weren't bad players. And then Uruguay, 5 0 loss was tough to take. That was midweek. Yeah. yeah, we got dong. Yeah. Um, and then we came back and won, which was Poland. brilliant. Yeah. yeah, it was lovely. Yeah. Yeah, it was a nice experience. It was good for the lads and they worked hard. And, and quite a few of them lads went on to a little career, didn't they? They did okay. Yeah. That was that that mags, yeah. right? Mags, the yeah. World Cup. It was that that was the Fallon High School brand was mm. was beaming out. You're almost a little bit of a Mister Fixit in that generation as well, because you, you had a stint with the Kings too. Yeah, that short notice. Yeah, no support whatsoever, no budget, nothing. It was a bit of a disaster, actually. What's your view on a New Zealand team playing in the Australian competition? It's a tough one. I mean, it's a tough one. I mean, I've been through it and was through. It through it with the Kings as I said it went nothing to remember you know it's nice being full time but it was always doomed to failure and I don't think anybody succeeded in it did they mm. don't think anybody took it away but where do they play I mean I, it, it's hard to put this in into perspective like where I'm from in South Yorkshire there are probably 10 professional clubs 
Auckland's got more. Do you know? Do you know the population of Manchester? Five hundred and odd thousand. What's Auckland? One point two. And we can't get a pro club. <laughs> this, why is it? Because we're so far down the ladder. That's all rugby. It's all rugby dominated. Everything else. But you know, this where I'm from, Leeds United, Rotherham United, Sheffield Wednesday, Sheffield United, York City, it goes on. Mm. You know, I've missed a few. They're just off the top of my head. Doncaster Rovers. They're all in the same area, South Yorkshire. Mm. You know, and the population's not great because as I said, when I looked at the Manchester one, five hundred and odd thousand in Manchester. It must be right in the middle of Manchester, not greater Manchester. But hey, Auckland's probably as big. If not bigger, they've got Manchester City and Manchester United. So we've, but but Auckland's tried it twice and failed, right? Yeah. So the support wasn't the people for whatever reason. Yeah. Part of it is the no stadium to play at. No one wanted to go out to North Harbour Stadium, and they tried it twice yeah. and it failed twice. So what is the answer? Yeah. We'd, we'd love a professional club, and we need a professional club. We need. More, I'd love a professional league. Mm. You know that we could evolve into a country with our own professional league. I mean, has rugby got it? Has rugby got their professional league? Not domestically, no. no. It's fallen over. They've got to go. They've got to see trans, yeah. well, trans Pacific, whatever you want to call it. It's not easy. It's not easy. I don't, it, it is a tough problem. It really is. I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. But we, when we get when we're having clubs playing in world club championships, they need to be well prepared, don't they? Yeah. It can be embarrassing. It can be frightening, actually, wasn't it? Running out against you know a top side, mm. and with all due respect. They've played Auckland City have done quite well when they've been away there, haven't they? Their yeah. results weren't bad. Yeah, yeah. Does that fill you with fear the thought of Monaco United playing against the Bayern Munich one day in a FIFA <laughs> well, World Cup? Yeah. I mean, what it, a dream though, yeah, as well. Yeah, it'd be great, but you, you'd always have a bit of fear that you could it could go belly up. As I said, Auckland, some of their performances have not been bad, have they? Mm -hmm. Not been bad at all. Great, Shay. How's our uh, list looking there, mate? A lot of ticks. I did have a question from George Suri. Big George. Yeah, Big George coming in saying, ask Kevin if he remembers the time Jerry Sam had chewing gum stuck on his track pants and he sat in the leather seat on your Jaguar all the way to Long Bay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you recall that happening at all? And it was, I think it was, it wasn't leather either. I think it was, what do they call it? Material. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry Sam. What a question from Big George. I hope, yeah. hope he listens. He remembered, obviously. Actually, George, George did say, I'll, 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 well, maybe we end on something really nice here. George did say, Kevin was my first coach in New Zealand and had a huge influence on me. I wouldn't be here, and he's living in Tauranga now, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. I didn't think that I would ever see or travel or study to New Zealand in my life. I thought it was only for rich parents with money. He made me a good person, and there's so much opportunities in the outside world than just living back in the Solomon Islands. He made me a confident player as well. He made sure that after my school year, I was looked after and they found a club for me and I was able to get a job and that was the beginning of my life. Isn't that lovely? Hey? Yeah, lovely. that's great. And, and that's, been a common, yeah, that's been a common theme from those who have played with you is that wider picture, isn't it? Um, so I think that's been really great. Thanks so much, Kev, for oh, inviting welcome. us into your home and uh, showing us your beautiful views and, <laughs> and running back through some, some history. And we'll see you on the first day of the opening of the Northern Premier League. Melville United, Monaco United away. Is that the one? That's us. Is it? Uh, yeah, we'll see you there. There we go. All right. Cheers, Kev. Thanks for your time. You're welcome.